I'm not entirely sure why, but floater fishing since day one, since the first time I ever caught a carp off the surface, has been my favorite way to catch carp. There aren't really any other types of carp fishing where you can pick out a specific fish, or rather choose that you'd rather catch one instead of another. Being able to watch the fish's behavior as well helps massively, and other than on very clear waters when you're fishing right on the edge, you don't often get the chance to observe their behavior before you catch them. And if you choose to, you can draw out the way of smaller ones or cast specifically towards the, the fish in the lake that you really want to catch. I've made it out now to sound like surface fishing is the be all and end all, and it really isn't. There's a lot of times in the year when it's not your go-to tactic, it's just not gonna work. But at certain times, in certain places, nothing can beat surface fishing. I think also the fact that a lot of people don't do it, a lot of people completely ignore it, no matter what the conditions are like, no matter what the fish's behavior is, being able to do it yourself gives you a massive edge over, over other anglers. If you can have floater fishing uh, in your armory, you will catch more carp than the next man. Going way, way back to when we first picked up a carp rod, the films, the DVDs, the magazines, all the media that we consumed try to teach us that the way you catch carp is to have three rods, to have bite alarms, to have big pit reels. It was quite confusing to us why any other species didn't require this equipment and didn't require this specialist approach. You know, why I could go on the river and catch a chub by tying on a hook and hooking on a worm, but for carp you had to do some magic. It was when we actually started carp fishing and didn't have the money to invest in load of kit and whatnot, we just resorted to, well, we'll just throw some bread in and hope for the best. I remember those days with very, very fond memories, either down the village pond, on a little day ticket near our house, or indeed the, the wild lakes that we discovered looking on Google Maps, but we never caught big carp back then. I remember those days with such fond memories because it was just the excitement, the buzz of catching a species which was made out to be this impossible fish to catch, but here we were discovering these waters yes. and catching carp for ourselves. Oh man. Particularly on places like where I am today, which is very overgrown, it wouldn't be beneficial to have multiple rod setups or loads of bait or anything. You're going in there um, with a tool in your hand and you're finding those carp location being absolutely paramount, being mobile and optimum aim. But there are times when you need to fish either further out, you need to introduce bait, uh, perhaps you're on a venue with a lot of fish and actually you're gonna be based in one swim for the majority of the day. And in those cases, you can bring a bit more gear with you, make your fishing more comfortable, and in the end, just catch more carp. So when it comes to tackle choices for carp fishing, I break it up into two styles of fishing. It's the opportunist, up close and personal stalking approach, or it's the session fishing approach. In a swim, fishing potentially at further range, introducing bait, trying to create a competitive feeding response. I tend to have a rod in my van at all times, not just because Alex and I work in the fishing industry, but also because it's convenient. I've got a six foot sawn off scope rod of two pound test curve, and that sits in the back, tucked away, and it's always there. It's not a case of, ah, oh, I'm gonna go fishing today. It's a case of, I'm going to work today. Who knows what I might stumble across on the way home. Uh, that rod stays in the van at all times, along with a cheap white loaf of bread. I do go for a lot of bread in my fishing. Firstly, because carp love it, and secondly, because it's convenient and cheap. I pair that six foot sawn off rod with a dinky little reel that only takes probably 100 yards of line or so. I don't need to be casting far. That setup is purely for up close and personal fishing picking out fish under the rod tip. If you're gonna be fishing in considerable snags, potentially deep water with very, very big fish, I would be saying, yeah, take the three pound uh, test curve option. But 
For the most part, I'm using fairly small hooks. I'm playing relatively small carp and the two pound test curve one in a, in a lake without too much snags is perfect. And uh, it's a joy to play fish on. For this stalking style approach, the only other items of tackle that I'll bring with me are a net in one hand, an unhooking mat over my shoulder or in my rucksack, and a waist pouch. The waist pouch to many will seem like a bit of an unnecessary item of luggage, particularly when I've often got a rucksack on as well, but being able to dip into that waist pouch to grab mixers to throw out or bread, hookable floaters to quickly rebate is so important. The worst thing you can do is find a fish in the margins, be ready to cast to it, and then be like, damn, I've got, to find my, I've got to find my hook baits that have been left on the floor or something. So having your kit accessible to your hand at any moment, especially when you need them quickly because you've just spotted a carp coming up, really makes the waste pouch ideal. The other side of my surface fishing revolves around the use of a controller float or bolt machine. This float on your line enables you to fish further out as well as giving you the increased chance of hooking a fish at long range. It's very likely that you won't be able to watch a carp come and actually take your hook bait off the surface, particularly when you're fishing, you know, 50, 60, 70, up to 100 or more yards from the bank. You're never gonna see the fish actually suck that bait down unless you have got some seriously good eyes on you. So when that float drags across the surface and the fish hooks itself, you're certainly quite grateful of that bolt machine on your line. The bolt machines come in a range of sizes. Most of the time I'm using something in the middle, but if you need to, you can fish over 100 yards with the largest size of bolt machine. I'd pair that up with a 12 foot 3.5 test curve rod. It's extreme range fishing and you need your rod and reel to, to match that. However, for the most part, I'm using the medium sized bolt machine. I'm using a nine or 10 foot scope rod in one of the slightly lighter test curves anything from a 1.75 up to a 2.75. Not only are those slightly lighter test curve scope rods lighter to hold in your hand, as you're often holding the rod for the majority of the day, but also when you've got a, you know, a big fish on a very small hook, it's quite nice to have a good through action rod that's gonna give when you need to, rather than a pokey rod that's gonna bump those small hooks out. With any type of surface fishing, or really any type of angling whatsoever, it is key to be mobile. If you're not willing to pack your gear away and chuck it on the barrow and move swims to where the fish are showing, it will hinder your angling. Most of the time I prefer not to use a barrow. It's quite nice just to be able to sling it over my shoulder, walk about between swims, flip between different areas. But if you are bringing a lot of bait with you, you know, got a big bucket full of riser pellet and 11 mil floaters, it's heavy, you're not gonna to want to move swims unless you do have the barrel with you. So it's about just weighing up how much bait you're bringing with you on a session and whether or not you need that barrel to move swims. As with your choices of rods and reels to use for surface fishing, the end tackle is also quite important. It's not maybe as complicated as people make uh, ledgering on the bottom. There's no, you know, leaders and multiple swivels and stuff included in the rigs. I think, to be honest, people are more conscious of finding down the tackle and making sure the fish can't see it because you can see it. When you've got a surface fishing rig sat on the surface in front of you, you want it to be as unobtrusive as possible. Starting with free lining, clues in the name, all you've really got on the line is a hook. I'll choose a size six floater claw with some bread, or maybe a smaller size of hook if I'm using a hookable floater or dog biscuit. When a slightly further cast is required, or I want to make multiple casts with a piece of bread without it falling off, which can be quite frustrating, I'll opt for a small bread bomb. Threading that onto the line, tying on your hook and pushing it down over the shank just means you can open that up bung in a big lump of bread, and like I say, multiple casts can be made without the bread falling off of the hook. It's not something I use when I'm fishing right under the rod tip or fishing for particularly spooky fish, but my God, there's been a number of occasions when I've had to keep casting at decent range, you know, trying to put it out near islands or underneath snags, and just having the bread not falling off every time is an absolute godsend.
So that's free lining. It wasn't going to take too long to describe the rigs that you use for that. However, fishing with a controller float or bolt machine on the line is slightly more complex, but still easily attainable by any level of angler. I'll take 12 pound zig flow as a main line. It's a floating monofilament, so there's no need to worry about it dipping beneath the surface. I'll thread that through my bolt machine, tie on a swivel, pop that back inside the bolt machine, which creates the bolt effect. Uh, it does release safely should you get snagged, but it's enough resistance to hook a carpet at long range without you needing to set the hook. To the other end of the swivel, I will tie a slightly lighter length of zig flow. Uh, 10 or 8 pounds. 8 pounds when the fish are very finicky or if I'm not fishing too close to any snags or weed, but 10 pounds is normally pretty much the perfect hook link for floater fishing. On the end of that hook link I'll use as small a hook as I can get away with, normally a size 10 floater claw with a 12 mil pop-up on a hair rig. Unlike the hair rigs I use when I'm bottom fishing, you know, trying to avoid bream or tench or whatever, I will actually shorten that hair right up so the bait is pretty much touching the hook. I feel that when that fish comes up, a lot of the time they will just sort of suck at it, they won't confidently take it in, and you do end up hooking more fish if that hook is right there hanging directly underneath the bait. Just means there's less chance of that fish getting away with it. And also I think when the fish looks up towards the bait on the surface, if the hook is actually hiding sort of underneath it, it's less likely to see it. The hook is less likely to be silhouetted against the sky, whereas it would be if you're using quite a long hair rig. In any branch of carp fishing, getting the carp feeding on your bait as opposed to natural food is the first step towards catching them. Okay, a lot of the time, uh, particularly on more wild venues, places that don't receive so much pressure, you can simply put on a bait, free line straight to them, single hook bait approach, and it will come up and nail it. That has worked for us on a number of occasions in the same way that free lining with sweet corn or maggots works very well. But there are times when you've got a number of fish maybe 30 yards or more from the bank, putting a single hook bait in amongst them is more likely to spook them than actually give you a chance of catching one. So the first thing to do is introduce some bait. Unlike when you're fishing on the bottom, you have to take into account wind. The drift can mess up a floater fishing session quite badly. If you loose feed and that bait drifts into a no fishing zone, someone else's swim, and those fish follow it, it's kind of game over for you, it's quite frustrating. On a flat calm day, of course, you can fire out that bait, it will land on the surface, and then you fish for them there and then. But, particularly if there's a bit of breeze, you want to try and get upwind of the fish, you want to try and feed before them, so that as the bait drifts down, it reaches those fish, and then they start feeding. The other key thing to remember with wind is that when you're actually casting your rig out, if there's a crosswind, your float will drag across the surface, and that creates a bait which is very unnatural will put the fish on edge if they are having a, a, a hook bait whizzing across the surface like that in front of them. So what you want to do is you want to try and get upwind and cast with the wind, either up against it or down with it. That way you're not having an unnatural movement of your hook bait. The optimum though is that you get on the back of the wind, you lose feed close in, that bait drifts out to the fish, not spooking them, and you're able to cast your float out over the top of the shoal draw it back in amongst those feeding fish. That's the best way that you can, you know, you can have a surface fishing session pan out. I totally understand though that on busy waters, sometimes it's just a case of getting whatever swim you're given. And in those cases, just try and be conscious of not loose feeding too much and having that bait drift into someone else's swim. It can frustrate other anglers, particularly if they're not floater fishermen th themselves. But if you've got a bait yourself and you can get that bait drifting down the wind perfectly into a shoal of carp, getting them competing, nothing beats putting a bolt machine in amongst them and just waiting for it to drag across the surface and the surface erupts. The other key thing to remember with your feeding approach when surface fishing is that the more you can get those fish competing for the bait, the easier they will get to catch. There's been many, many times where I haven't been able to resist the temptation to just cast straight in, the fish have spooked off of the float and it's game over. Whereas the times where I've had the best surface fishing sessions have been when I've had all day. I've not been in a rush, loose fed, got them competing, got them taking those baits, just circling, pack manning. They are chasing each other to get to the bait first. Then when you put the float out, they're not bothered about the float, they're just bothered about getting that next bait in their mouths, and then you can absolutely have it off. Alex and I have had sessions when 
it just feels like the bite's never going to stop. Those fish have got so preoccupied on taking the bait, be it riser pellet, 11 mil floaters, or bits of bread, and they are competitively feeding, and that's when you have your best sessions. So I've spoken about loose feeding in general and the ways you should go about doing it, but not really the actual baits to use. Now, with fishing on the bottom, there's a magnitude of baits available on the market. There's a lot written about the best baits to use, the best ways to get those fish competing and feeding, the best ways to pick out bigger carp as opposed to small ones with certain recipes of boilies and pellets and stuff. But with surface fishing, people just tend to take like a disregard to that. They just go, oh, well, I'm going floater fishing. All I need is a bag of Tesco chum mixers. I wonder sometimes why it's so vital that you use a, a high nutritional value boily when you're fishing on the bottom, but a chum mixer on the top doesn't seem to make any difference. Well, certainly, if you pay attention to the baits that you're using on the surface, you can sway the odds in your favor. Of course, you'll catch carp on bread. Of course, you'll catch carp on Dog biscuits, uh, it's proven, and people will keep catching carp on those baits, possibly forever. But on particular venues where those fish have seen it all before, on venues which are pressured, which are fished day to day by good surface anglers, you can give yourself more chance of catching by mixing up a similar sort of spot mix to what you'd use on the bottom, albeit with floating ingredients. Everyone at Nash has experienced the ridiculous pulling power of riser pellet. The smaller sizes and particularly the very small ones which sink slowly through the water have shown to us on numerous occasions how a lake which appears dead and there's nothing feeding on the surface ends up with just fish going absolutely nutty in front of you and, uh, and taking baits left, right and center. But what we've also seen with the riser pellet is that they can get preoccupied on it. They can start just sucking those tiny little baits down with ease and start to ignore larger baits uh, and particularly ignore your hook bait. So the way to get the best of both worlds is some riser pellets, some 11 mil floaters, also mix in some dog biscuits as well, cost effective baiting and give it a bit of liquid. Mixing those baits of different sizes together with a liquid mean that not only are you flattening off the surface but you're also keeping those fish guessing. They're not getting preoccupied on one size and when you put a hook bait in amongst that they have no reason to differentiate your hook bait from the loose feed. On particularly pressured waters and places where we are struggling to get those fish taking off the surface, taking that liquid, rolling all your baits in it and then dusting it in some stick mix just clouds the water up a little bit. Those particles of stick mix falling through the water, the different sizes of bait on the surface and of course the pulling power of the liquid just mean that like you're giving yourself every chance of getting those fish competing and getting them coming up taking those baits. About a month ago, I managed to get out for my first surface fishing session of the year. My buddy Lewis had been catching a few really nice carp from a lake in the Colm Valley. He'd also taken a colleague of ours, Mark Voosen, down there not too long before, and he'd also caught a couple of fish. Whilst on the topic of Mark Voosen, working at Nash Tackle on the media team, we get to see lots of exciting footage. Some of the best I've actually seen lately came from Mark and it's possibly the coolest floater fishing footage I've ever seen. Anyway, back to the session with Lewis. We arrived at about midday and found that he'd already managed to catch one. Seeing that he'd already caught one off the top made us pretty confident. It gave us the inspiration to, you know, run back to the van, grab the gear, start baiting up and uh, try and catch one ourselves. That session actually ended up being quite tricky. It's often those times when you're so confident, other people are catching around you, the fish are feeding, the weather's good, Everything just seems to go wrong sometimes and I don't believe I actually did anything wrong with my tactics but I was quite unlucky. Move swims on a couple of occasions, started seeing the fish coming up where I was before. 
ended up just baiting one area, consistently casting to the same zone, not being distracted by the odd fish coming up left, right and center. And I just waited it out. And yeah, eventually managed to get myself a bite. Whilst holding my dark common up for the cameras, Lewis, further down the bank, hooked up as well. We didn't run over to uh, see him at the time because it didn't really look all that big. It wasn't fighting very hard, but as soon as I slipped my fish back and I ran down to see him, we realized Lewis had got a bit of a chunk in the net. Certainly one that made my fish look quite small. This is my new UK PB common and my biggest surface caught carp. Uh, 30 pound, four ounces, I'm over the moon. I spent quite a lot of this spring really wanting to get on the bank, desperate to get out and do some surface fishing. But when the conditions have been prime, we've either been out the country traveling or we've been back home and it's been the rest of the Nash team that has been out surface fishing and, uh, and I've been filming them. Looking at all this footage we've captured in recent years of surface fishing makes me just realise surface fishing isn't just a ridiculously enjoyable, pleasurable, excitable way to catch carp, but it's also really, really effective. The sheer numbers of carp that are caught off the top year by year just prove that if you don't pick up that floater rod, if you don't have the bread, the dog biscuits, the riser pellet in your armoury, you're missing out on so many opportunities over the course of a year. So all that's left to say is good luck with your surface fishing this year. Whether you're trying to catch big carp from a pressured syndicate or just having fun catching little ones from a day ticket lake, I hope that you get the time to get out on the bank and enjoy what is quite possibly the greatest way to catch carp.